Hi there and welcome to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. And today we're gonna to have a great show. Dr. Chris Reinhardt, who is the feedlot extension specialist for the state of Kansas, is gonna join us. We're gonna talk about heat stress in beef cattle and feed yards and beyond. Stay tuned for the show. Closed caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. Welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. It's great to have you here, Dr. Reinhardt. Dr. Chris Reinhardt is the extension feedlot specialist for the state of Kansas, and he's a good friend and colleague, and we snagged him today to stop by, and we're going to talk about heat stress in, in feeder cattle. And it's one of those things that's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and how bad. That's exactly right, especially here in the center of the U.S., it's going to get hot. It always does. Yep. So when you're starting to talk about heat stress, because, you know, cattle, um, you know, they seek shade and they, they get in the ponds and the different things to this nature. But what are some of the things that are driving heat stress? And I mean, from if I'm standing there trying to look at the weather radar or I'm looking at a weather report, what are some of the things I need to be focused on? There's really four things and I'll add a fifth. The first is obviously the actual outs outside temperature. Second is the relative humidity. Third is the amount of wind or breeze that's available. And fourth is the amount of direct sunlight and, and by reverse, the amount of cloud cover that's out there. But the fifth one is how many consecutive days of really stressful conditions we have in a row. Okay, so it can be a heat building effect in these animals not necessarily a one real hot day and 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 cause issues exactly and and the more of these days we stack up one on top of another especially if it doesn't cool down at night we can expect some at very least uh, very poor performance from the cattle and 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 beyond and 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 in the more humid areas as well we have uh, less of a chance of those animals to recover we get to those arid uh, climates out in, in western Kansas, west Texas, and things to that desert type, uh, low humidity really cools off in the evening compared to those sticky Midwest summer nights. As we get from the middle of Kansas, the middle of Texas on east, that's where the humidity really becomes oppressive. Yeah. So when we're talking about temperature, relative humidity, and, and wind speed, those are the three components that make up what we call the thermal heat index, right? Correct. And so as heat goes up, as humidity goes up, we have an increase in kind of like um, wind chill, the opposite of wind chill. Exactly. You know, but uh, how do we use that? A real easy figuring is I like to stop working cattle when the blend of heat and humidity is really uncomfortable for us as human beings. We can do the, the complicated formula. Uh, but if it's if it's extremely warm and even if there's humidity, but if there's a nice 10 mile an hour continuous breeze, the cattle are going to remain relatively comfortable. It's when the humidity goes up and the breeze shuts off that the cattle will really struggle. So that's when we got to start making some management decisions and, and uh, things in our day to day management systems or processing crews. We're going to have to make some changes. Great points. We're going to take a break when we come back. We're going to talk more with Dr. Reinhardt about heat stress and feeder cattle. You're watching Doc Talk. We're glad you joined us. This segment was brought to you by Brute Cattle Equipment, makers of the Brute Stealth Hydraulic Chute. If the chute fits, swear by it. Visit our website for more information. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. Working your cattle just got easier. Introducing the new Vet Gun Delivery System, a new way to apply topical insecticides to your cattle. 
The vet gun lets you remotely treat cattle with effective parasite control, so you can do it from an ATV, on horseback, or just walking among the herd. It's that simple. The proven topical insecticide AML Vet Cap is used with the vet gun. It works fast to control horn flies and lice while minimizing stress on your cattle. Fast, easy, effective. Vet Gun. Check with your animal health supplier for availability. Hello friends, I'm Ernie Rodina. And I'm Don Dawson with the Better Horses Radio Show. For over nine years, we've been bringing the Better Horses Radio Show to markets all across the Midwest. We talk about God, lots about horses. We talk about cows, we talk about horse health, we talk to top trainers, and we even talk about Roy Rogers. We are having a blast with Better Horses Radio Show and would love to take it to a market near you. So visit our website at betterhorsesradio.com and let us or your local radio station know you'd like to hear it in your area. The Better Horses Radio Show is unbelievable. You know, I think people are just kind of born with a passion. I wouldn't be where I am today without that horse. Oh, I'm not passionate about horses. That's just something that's in here. Uh, I can't explain it. Some people go to a job every day. I just go do what I love to do. That's all I know is horse. The bottom line, we're for the horse. It's whatever we can do to make life better for the horse, wherever they are, whatever they do. It's just magic, that's all. They just, they just, they got me. If we always do what's right for the horse, we will never go wrong. This segment is brought to you by Norbrook Laboratories, manufacturers of Enriflox 100, the newest addition to your arsenal for treating bovine and swine respiratory disease. Welcome back to the show, folks. Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University, and I'm joined by Field uh, State Feedlot Extension Specialist, Dr. Chris Reinhardt, who is a Associate Professor over in the Department of Animal Science and Industries. And we spend a lot of time on the road. We were just out in Scott City. We've been out in, in different parts of the country. Um, we're talking about heat stress. It's that time of year, Doc. It's, I know. And when we start heading into summertime and, and things like that, I hear people say, well, probably won't get hot this summer. Or might not get cold this winter, but guess what? It does, doesn't it? Every year. And, and really, there's one of the things we love about agriculture is it's different every day. But the other thing we love about agriculture is it's the same every year. We just have a short memory. That's very short. <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about, uh, one of the things I wanted Chris to address with us today is talk about clinical signs and the subclinical signs of, of heat stress. So let's start out with the clinical signs. Well, this is an animal that's obviously had enough um, fun in the sun and, and, and now we're talking it's in, in heat stress mode. So what are some of the things that you would gauge just looking across the herd? It, depending on which end of the scale you want to start with, Doc, but as soon as we start to see the sides of cattle moving up and down, especially rapidly, we know that animal has entered into, yeah, technically the, the term is heat stress. They may not be, uh, their life isn't in jeopardy or anything to that nature but they're clearly having to expend energy just to cool off. So they're going to be panning and, and uh, you know, I didn't know, I mean, cattle do, that's how they cool their body, it's through the panning, but, uh, you know, the other thing is cattle have sweat glands. Yes. And I, I did not know that until we were studying a, a deal on anatomy and the, their sweat glands are located in the armpits just in, and in the crotch area just like humans and, and um, so, you know, there, there's that opportunity to cool as well. That panting, it's like you say, their evaporating moisture uh, is a lot more efficient to get rid of heat than, than the sweating does, but, but both are critical. You bet. You bet. So, so those are some of the clinical signs that we're going to see in these animals. What about the subclinical signs? I mean, what are some of the things you may not notice, you know, just driving up and down the feed alleys on a day-to-day -day basis or, or by your show steers? on a day-to-day -day basis, but these animals, what are some of the subclinical signs? Well, the thing we can do as cattlemen is sort of step out, out step outside our own comfort zone and, and literally say, if I'm uncomfortable, 
What about that 1,300 pound black hided animal standing out in the sun all day long? They're probably uncomfortable. Even if that side isn't rapidly moving, we know they're having to sort of turn on some systems within their metabolism to get rid of excess heat. And the, the thing we need to remember about that is, as beef producers is that's costing performance. Sure. So, so clinically, we can see the animals panting, succumbing to the heat. Subclinically, it's going to be through the loss of performance. Exactly. They will eat less when they're hot and uncomfortable. Frankly, their body is saying, I don't need a lot of extra energy, so they're going to back off on feed, but then they're also going to burn energy just to try and stay cool. Great. After the break, we're going to talk more with Dr. Reinhardt about how to alleviate some of the heat stress in these cattle. You're watching Doc Talk, and we're really glad that you joined us. This Meet the Veterinarian is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals. Dr. Joe Hillhouse, owner of Carson County Vet Clinic in Panhandle, Texas, also serves as the District 8 Director of the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, is a charter organization representative of the Boy Scouts of America and a member of the Panhandle Lions Club. When Dr. Hillhouse finally carves out some time, you'll find him enjoying the outdoors with a fishing pole in hand. As dependable as the sunrise, in dairy parlors, open pastures, on ranches and feed yards across America, a place where reputation is more than a name, where the science of healthier animals is a way of life. It's the responsibility that drives who we are and what we do. Every decision, every day. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. This hog is Hanover hoof for meal made from U.S. soybeans. Now, one hog isn't that impressive, but suppose we add another, and another, and another. Before long, you've got billions of hungry customers around the world all clamoring for the same thing. Our soybeans. Learn more about the billion-dollar appetite of animal agriculture at beyondtheelevator.com. Brought to you by America's Soybean Farmers and their checkoff. The Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine is a leader in food animal research and education. Our researchers are constantly expanding the knowledge of animal health and food safety. Through the Veterinary Health Center and the Kansas State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, we provide practical services for animal producers. Home of the Beef Cattle Institute, the college is committed to animal welfare training and research. The Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine, knowledge and service for the future of animal production. Cow-calf, stalker, and feedlot producers know that effective parasite control improves overall herd performance and profitability. Norbrook offers a comprehensive, economical line of poron and injectable parasiticides for every livestock operation. Consult with your local animal health supplier to set up a program that protects your investment and brings larger cattle checks this fall. See for yourself why the Noromectin line from Norbrook is the practical choice for your herd. Hi there folks, Dr. Dan from Doc Talk here. Hope you join me next week as we're going to discuss ergot toxicity in cows and horses. Be sure to join me here every Monday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and I'll see you down the road. TrueTest Group, weighing systems, electronic identification, EID, electric fencing, and dairy automation systems help farmers and ranchers around the world manage the performance of their livestock for ultimate profitability. Welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson from the College of Veterinary Medicine here with Dr. Chris Reinhardt, who is an associate professor over in the Department of Animal Science and Industries here at Kansas State University. And state, state, and Chris is our state feedlot extension specialist. And uh, Chris, we've been talking about some of the clinical signs, some of the subclinical signs, but there can be a point in time with these animals where it's an emergency situation. And, and so, what are those animals going to look like that, that are in dire straits that really need emergency treatment right now? I like your word emergency, Doc, because these animals we're going to describe, they're on the verge of potential death. They're, ex they're doing everything in their power to get rid of heat, but unfortunately all those systems are actually generating a bunch more heat. These are the animals you'll see standing, sometimes over top of the water source, uh, they've got posty legged they're trying to uh, expand their chest capacity and their mouth is gaping open and they're heaving 
uh, in and out as fast and as hard as they can, especially big, uh, heavy, black-hided cattle, uh, it's time to intervene and fast. Well, and, and you know, we've all seen these animals and, and, and uh, you're right, it's, it's an emergency situation. It's something that you can't develop the plan for these animals when it happens. You need to think ahead um, to when this is going to happen. And we always encourage that you work with your, your uh, veterinarian to make sure that you have that emergency uh, plan in place for when such a catastrophe will, will happen. Now, um, Chris, when, when, what are we wanting to do with these animals? We've got to get their core temperature down as fast as possible, and that'll most likely involve getting a water hose on the back of these cattle. Uh, secondly, can I get them to shade, or can I get shade to them? Uh, again, I keep talking about black-hided cattle. It makes a huge difference uh, how dark-hided the cattle are. They're absorbing a tremendous amount of sunlight. Again, we mentioned previously multiple days in a row. They might not have had a chance to cool down in between those episodes. We've got to get them cooled down. Yeah. So, so shade, water. Um, we've we've built water baths. Get water tanks. Get fluids in them. Different things of that nature. Another another treatment that that uh, I've heard recently um, for these animals. And we had a case with a show steer going down at a fair in, in heat exhaustion actually treating them with a, with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, um, something like dexamethasone has been utilized in emergency situations as well to lessen that core body temp. Um, but, uh, you know, these things are all things that, that, are, that are good to mention. Anything else on these critters? Or Anecdotally, uh, it's good to get water baths out there. Make sure you're getting a metal tank out there. The cattle, especially if they're under extreme heat stress, they're going to want to get in it, and if it's not made of the right materials, they'll tell it, tear it apart in seconds. And so all your, all your hard work and money went for nothing. So get a big, round, sturdy tank out there. They'll use it. We've learned that with the, with the rubber tanks, where they've, they've just jumped in them and uh, gone over the sides. So um, I think seeing it, getting it, uh, getting temporary shade up, um, you know, are all things. Sometimes though, getting the wild, ground wet and humidity, raising humidity can be counterproductive. So you want to be really careful on the animals that you pick. You're watching Doc Talk. We're going to come back after the break and we're going to talk about some preventative measures for heat stress. Thanks for joining us. Beef producers asked for it and Norbrook delivers. Introducing new Enroflox 100, the newest addition to your arsenal for treating bovine respiratory disease. Enroflox 100 is an FDA-approved, ready-to-use injectable antimicrobial solution to treat BRD associated with Mannheimia hemolytica, Pasteurella multocida, and Histophilus somni in beef and non-lactating dairy cattle. Administered SQ as a multiple-day therapy. Consult with your veterinarian today about Enroflox 100, the new choice. Hi, I'm Kevin Oxner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen and Colorado Rancher. Join me each week as the National Cattlemen's Beef Association brings you the latest updates in industry information and market news. Plus, each week we provide important educational information and features on cattlemen from across the country just like you. And we can't forget our favorite cowboy poet, Paxter Black. Join me for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, debuting Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern right here on RFD TV. Hi there folks, Dr. Dan from Doc Talk here. We all have to buy hay and we all have a lot of things that we test for in hay, but one thing when we have a wet spring followed by a drought summer is ergots. Dr. Steve Inslee, a veterinary toxicologist from Iowa State University is gonna be joining me next week to discuss ergot toxicity in hay and grasses. Be sure to join me here every Monday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on RFD TV and I'll see you down the road. Join the team, the Beef Quality Assurance Team. Getting BQA certified shows you're committed to practices that produce the highest quality beef in the world. And by visiting BQA.org, you can take the online certification course at a time that fits your schedule and from the comfort of your home or office. You'll also find lots of helpful tips on improving animal health and animal handling practices. Get certified, BQA certified, because it's about doing the right thing. Visit BQA.org today and become a member of the BQA team. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. 
Welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Chris Reinhardt, and we are from Kansas State University, and we're talking about heat stress. We've talked about signs, clinical signs, thermal heat index, emergency situations. You know, besides ceasing and desisting and desisting the activity. So we're going to stop processing. We're going to stop moving cattle during the hot times of the day. What are some of the other preventative measures that you like to enlist in the home pen or, or that to, to prevent heat stress? Well, we talked previously about black hide and cattle. The black hide and hair simply absorbs a ton of light out of, out of, the, of, of sunlight. And if we can get those cattle shaded, especially the big cattle. If we can focus on one area of the feed yard, it's gonna get those cattle that are 60 days from market under some shade. And, and that's usually enough to keep them from moving into mildly uncomfortable into clinical extreme emergency situation. So uh, shade, uh, what, what are some of the other, water? Water is a big one. We've got, a, a, as you mentioned before, let's prepare for summer. It seems to come every year. Uh, intake of cattle during normal cool uh, circumstances will be about three times the amount of dry matter the cattle are eating. Uh, during the hot summertime, it's going to be more like five times, so not quite double uh, their water consumption during those hot periods. We've got to prepare for that and make we'll, sure we're going to have adequate water supply. And we always said, you know, if we don't have enough water pressure, enough water tank space, things of like that, you're going to have to make sure that you get a tank that you can increase the water pressure above ground if you have deep wells. And, and then some of the other things is if cattle are bunching around the water tanks, you may have to put a silver tank out in the pen and, and fill it up to get by during these heat stress moments. Cattle, especially the bully cattle, will hover over those water sources, not because they're needing more to drink, they're simply uh, breathing over that cool air. It's cooler. What about wind? How could I increase ventilation of cattle that are in a feeder pen? Two things, number one is mounds. We know how great mounds are during wet and muddy conditions. Uh, something somebody smarter than me once said, cattle don't lie, they can't lie. And when you see cattle using shade or when you see cattle using mounds, they should be telling you something. They're more comfortable in those areas. And the thing about mounds during the summertime, even if it's dry, is cattle can usually get up on top of that mound and find a little bit of breeze. Yeah, the cattle will face the breeze in the summer and they look away from it, put their tail in the breeze in the winter. Um, what about weeds, windbreaks? If you've got windbreaks in place, I understand in the northern climate where we're fighting that January blizzard, uh, they're important. But in the, in the Midwest where we operate, I'm not sure windbreaks are nearly as important as w in, the, in the wintertime as not having them and having access to wind is during the summertime. Cool. I appreciate you being here on the show. You've really brought a light to a very serious uh, uh, situation. And just through that prevention, don't work cattle when it gets hot. Get them some shade, get them water, build some mounds for ventilation, knock down those weeds and windbreaks, prevent some heat stress. It's important. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Remember, if you want to know more about what we do here at the College of Veterinary Medicine, you can find us on the web at www.vet.ksu. Dot edu. Remember to always work with your local practitioner. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. You've joined me today on Doc Talk. We're sure glad that you did, and I'll see you down the road. Folks, I'm so proud to be a part of the beef industry and, and the many things that, that we and cattle producers get done, whether it's looking at, at cow-calf operations, stalker and backgrounder operations, or, or things that we do here in commercial cattle feeding operations. We really do produce a safe, wholesome, affordable product for consumers. And it goes from a lot of people who care a lot about the cattle that they raise, and they care about the customer that they're serving and the consumer. And when we look at programs such as Beef Quality Assurance, Progressive Beef, things that are tied into providing a, a product on the table, it gets down to being able to execute it at the ground level. And we have so many people that care. We're very thankful for the opportunity that the industries here in Kansas allow us to come into their operations, provide some transparency, and show you what all goes into providing the meat and eggs that are on your dinner table. Thanks for watching the show, and I'll see you down the road. 
Closed caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. For more information about this program or previous programs, go to DocTalkTV.com.